Okay, welcome everyone to uh, study on the Book of Romans. It's uh, just so glad to be teaching the, uh, the third year students. Uh, you know, all of you have journeyed the last two years and now come to third year. I miss teaching you uh, uh, last year, right? I didn't teach you any subjects both fall and uh, spring semester. Uh, kingdom builders in the in the first semester then miss teaching you all in the in the spring semester but it's good to be back uh, teaching all of you uh, so welcome um, to our study on the book of um, Romans um, uh, and uh, you know sorry that I just took a little time to get uh, to all the setup because I just rushed in for my uh, second year class I two hours there, we have to move to a different classroom, we have to set up everything uh, again, so it's a whole new aspect for us every time we have to run from one classroom to the other, but uh, well, it's exciting and it's a joy to be teaching all of you in the third year, and this is your uh, uh, this is your uh, final year, right? But then you have one more uh, semester to go through. Anyways, Okay, welcome uh, to our study on the Book of Romans. I have shared uh, the PDF content of the course material uh, with you. It's on your um, uh, the live stream page. I'll have to also manually admit students, so that will take some time as well. Uh, also, a warm welcome to all our um, e-learning students. Um, welcome to uh, class and um, uh, your uh, uh, course material is also posted in the content tab, so you can go there and access um, the course content over there, the book of uh, Romans, the lecture notes that is there. Um, but for the online students, it's um, made available on the stream page, the PDF um, uh, uh, content of the course material is there. I hope you also read my had time to read my welcome note and uh, the introduction to uh, the course. Uh, it's like you to take a couple of uh, uh, minutes to just read that. Um, I posted it on the stream page, so you can read, uh, not now, you can read later on after class, okay? Please read my welcome note and also uh, introduction to uh, this course. Um, now, during my lectures, I will be sharing a lot of additional uh, content. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, for this class, I'll have to manually admit students. So if I just pause in between, let's be, you know, working with the student to admit them in. Um, so um, during my lectures, I will be sharing a lot of additional uh, content with the fresh insights for each chapter but I've decided that I would not include this in the course content. Uh, the reason being that I would encourage active participation and uh, attentiveness during the classes, uh, as I believe that this would really enhance um, our learning experience, uh, 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 learning experience uh, just by presenting some fresh insights during the lecture you know, that go beyond the, the, the existing course content. I just hope to, you know, inspire all of you to attend classes regularly, actively listen, and take down uh, notes. But if I put everything in the notes, then, you know, for sometimes uh, we can just think, hey, I don't need to attend the lecture because um, all she says is just there in, that, in the lecture. Um, so I can just read through it, but, you know, um, you are coming to class would also be an active participation where you are listening, taking down uh, notes, um, and also will be uh, benefited by attending uh, these uh, classes. So please note that um, for the assessments, I will also be adding in the additional content which I'll be sharing during the lectures, which is not there in the notes, uh, which means you will have to listen carefully, you know, follow through with the notes that is there at the PDF format and also make your own notes which can really help. And this is, um, you know, um, a book in the Bible, it's a powerful book uh, which we can learn uh, so many doctrines and teachings and so it will just 
benefit if you take more notes and it will help you in understanding uh, the various doctrines, the various teachings and also about give you fresh insights about the whole aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, For this course, um, we would be having uh, four um, graded as assessments. Uh, each 25%. So there are 16 chapters in the Book of Romans. So each uh, assessment will be on four chapters. So uh, there are four graded assessments. Um, and um, yeah, and once we finish chapter one to four, then we'll uh, fix a date for the first assessment. And then we will do that uh, uh, likewise for the other chapters as well. Okay. Uh, any questions anyone has before we move ahead? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then, um, you know, we'll begin with um, the Book of Romans. Uh, it's one of... Uh, the most important books in the uh, New Testament. Now, when I say that it is uh, one of the most important books in the New Testament, um, just a minute, please. Okay, so when I say that uh, this is one of the most important books in the New Testament, I don't want to overstate things as though, you know, the book of Romans is the most important book in the New Testament. Uh, yet we see that Paul's epistle to the Romans is regarded by many as the best expressions of Christian doctrine. And Romans is considered as the most important book uh, theologically or doctrinally. Uh, it deals with the doctrine of Christ. Now, when we say the word, when we talk about doctrines, doctrines basically mean a belief or a set of beliefs held and taught by someone. So in other terms, doctrines are basically teachings and here in the book of Romans, it deals specifically with the doctrine of Christ. It presents uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, in a way that is not presented in any other epistles. And uh, scholars consider Paul's letter uh, to the believers at Rome as his most important work doctrinally. So Romans, the book of Romans, the epistle of uh, Romans is one of the best expressions of the Christian doctrines compared uh, to other books. Uh, the other epistles of Paul, uh, you know, actually addresses certain elements of Christian life or uh, the life of the church. And we see that Paul is writing those episodes, whether to the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae, uh, the church at Corinth. He's basically writing those episodes to address certain problems in the churches, or he's writing those episodes, uh, you know, to help the churches that are facing some issues or problems. But this epistle that he's writing uh, to the church at Rome is more doctrinal. It's more teaching uh, orient, uh, oriented. Uh, it begins, uh, you know, from the existence of God. So Paul begins Romans talking about the existence of God. And then he goes through a journey of sin and salvation. He talks about the gift of righteousness. Uh, the grace of God, and then he talks about Christian uh, living, okay? And again, forgive me for saying this, but uh, this is the best episode uh, when it comes to Christian doctrine or teaching. I'm not saying this because I'm teaching the book of Romans, but it's actually one of the best episodes when it comes to Christian doctrines or uh, teaching. 
Hence, uh, it is very important uh, to study and understand this book. Uh, and this is the only book or the only place in the New Testament where we have three chapters that explain to us the relationship between the church and Israel. Okay, I'll repeat that again. Um, uh, this is the only place in the New Testament, or this epistle, or this book is the only place in the New Testament where you know we have about three chapters that explain to us the relationship between the church and Israel. Of course, the book of Hebrews has somewhat, you know, some little content uh, of this in terms of the covenant. Uh, but what is God doing, you know, with the church? You find it uh, in the book of uh, Romans. Again, uh, it's a very, it's very unique from this perspective uh, because it's talking about uh, connecting the church and uh, Israel. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, it's entirely talking about this nation or the people of um, Israel. Uh, where, and we also read various prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah, coming of Jesus Christ. And we see that the New Testament starts off with Jesus and the church. And then we wonder what happened to Israel, because the whole of Old Testament talks about Israel, everything is about this nation, Israel, all of the covenants, all of the prophets, all of the kings, um, all of the prophecies. And, uh, you know, when we come to the New Testament, yes, we see the fulfillment of the prophecies as talking about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, we see it happening in reality, fulfilled in the New Testament. Uh, but then it goes on to talk about the church, and then we're wondering, hey, where did Israel disappear? What happened to uh, the nation of um, Israel? Okay, so, um, you know, uh, 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 and what is God doing with the church? You find that in the book of Romans. And also we see that, you know, um, uh, yeah, this book also talks about the relationship uh, between the church and the people of Israel or the nation of um, Israel. Okay. Now this book of Romans has many key doctrines and teachings uh, which are established here in this book. Uh, so some of the key doctrines or teachings are the existence of God, uh, the issue of sin and salvation, uh, the issue of sin and conscious, conscience, the issue of salvation, the issue of grace, uh, the issue of righteousness, and the issue of Christian living in various aspects basically talks about how uh, you know Christians or believers can relate to uh, sin, government, and people around them or other people in their um, lives. So all these are the key teachings or the key doctrines of the church and it's covered here in the book of Romans, okay? So let's look at when Paul wrote this book and why he wrote it and um, what are some of the things that Paul was expecting to happen. Okay, before we move on, anyone has any questions? No? Can you hear me clearly? Online yes, students? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we look at when Paul wrote this book, why he wrote it, and what are some of the things um, uh, Paul was expecting to uh, happen. Now, all of what we read in the book of Romans happens during the first century, and these the dates that are mentioned here in the introduction are kind of approximate dates because we have proofs, archaeological proofs, and all of that to prove to us, and also parallel, uh, you know, um, uh, scripture verses from uh, the book of Acts, which we can connect to, and we can see, and so all the dates that are mentioned here are kind of approximate uh, dates. So we look at, uh, you know, the background on Paul's episode to the Romans, 
Now, during Paul's second missionary journey, which happened during AD 49 to 52, we see that Paul uh, stayed at Corinth for a good 18 months. And we read this in Acts chapter 18, verse 11. And during that time, he meets uh, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And Aquila and Priscilla basically stay in Rome. Uh, they have their, uh, a home church in Rome. They're very active in uh, doing ministry um, uh, uh, in Rome. They also run a, a business like Paul. They were also tent makers. And uh, during um, AD uh, 49, we see that uh, an issue was, uh, you know, uh, 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 sorry, an, an edict was issued by the Roman Emperor Claudius in AD 49, and he ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So basically, the, uh, you know, Jews were persecuted, the believers uh, were persecuted in um in uh, Rome and the Jews specifically were asked to leave Rome and we read this in Acts chapter 18 verses 1 to 3 okay so um, Aquila and Priscilla had to move out of Rome so they traveled to um, uh, Corinth and when they came to Corinth you know um, uh, they since they also had the same uh, business like Paul, they were tent makers, so Paul went over to meet them and, you know, uh, they worked with Paul, uh, Aquila and Priscilla worked with Paul in making tents and also ministering to the uh, church or the believers at uh, Corinth, okay. And Paul, through Aquila and Priscilla, l heard a lot about the believers or the house churches uh, at Rome uh, from this couple. Okay. And when Jews were permitted to go back to Rome uh, in AD 54, we see Aquila and Priscilla. Um, we see Aquila and Priscilla going back uh, to Rome, um, and um, you know, uh, continuing the work there, continuing the church that they had uh, started there and their uh, ministry. There. But we see that Paul got gets excited about hearing about the church at Rome. It's not a place that Paul had gone before. He's never been to Rome. He's never established churches there. He's never ministered there. But uh, we will read and see how it has always been his desire and how he longs to go and meet the believers at uh, Rome. Okay. Now, later during his third missionary journey, during Paul's third missionary journey in AD 53 to 58, you know, Paul spends most of his time, uh, about three years in Ephesus. Uh, we read this in Acts 19. He does a powerful work in Ephesus where he is also, you know, not just teaching the synagogue, but he moves on to the to the hall of Tyrannus, and then he's teaching there, he's imparting, it becomes like a Bible school, and many uh, believers are trained, they're building the word, and we see that many of them go around the city of Ephesus and the seven churches that we read in Revelation, uh, which is around the city of Ephesus, where actually started by um, these um, believers uh, who were trained in the the, this hall of Tyrannus, or Tyrannus that uh, Paul was um, uh, teaching and ministering during those three years uh, at Ephesus. And then we see that Paul goes on to Macedonia. We read this in Acts chapter 20, verse 1. And then he goes on to Greece. We read this in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, uh, which would basically include cities like Athens and Corinth. Uh, and when Paul was in Corinth, uh, he wrote to the believers at Rome, and this is about AD, AD 57. Now, why do we say that Paul wrote uh, this uh, epistle uh, to the Romans, uh, uh, to the church at Rome? Uh, why did he write it from Corinth? Uh, we have a few indicators that indicate to us that it's most likely uh, that he wrote from Corinth. Uh, it's most likely that he wrote this epistle of Romans from Corinth. Uh, we read this uh, in this chapter. It's in the same book itself in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, 
where Paul says, you know, guys, my host and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasure of the city, greets you and Quartus, a brother. So we see that Paul um, mentions that he's staying in the house of Gaius or Gaius, who's very likely the same Gaius who's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. And we also see that uh, Paul is mentioning about Erastus. Now, Erastus uh, um, was a city treasurer or the head of the public work uh, department, and he lived in Corinth. And we read this uh, also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, where Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. So he's telling Timothy, hey, you know, Erastus stayed on in Corinth. So, you know, and uh, since he mentions about Erastus, uh, it's most, and he stayed in uh, Gaius's house, it's most likely that he writes this letter to the church at Rome from Corinth, okay? And another confirmation that we have of Erastus' existence uh, or that he lived in Corinth um, was a title that was found in the city of uh, Corinth. Uh, archaeologists, you know, when they were excavating this um, part of this land at Corinth, during the first century, they uncovered a stone uh, with Erastus' name as an huddle, uh, uh, in, uh, and it's a Roman pavement that was found uh, east of the theater at Corinth. And the inscription, uh, you know, um, was uh, found out by arch archaeologists in the, the late 1920s, and it reads, that Erastus, for his adulship, uh, paved at his own expense. Now, the term adul means, uh, you know, it refers to somebody who is uh, uh, a public official in ancient Rome who was uh, responsible for the maintenance of uh, public buildings uh, or regulation of markets and uh, organization of games and festivals. So we see that, um, you know, the stone was uncovered, was found by archaeologists in the late um, 1920s, and the, the stone with Erastus' name as in Hedil, uh, in, in a Roman pavement, uh, where he uh, spent his own money in just, ex you know, paving the road at his own um, uh, expense. So we see that, um, you know, Paul most likely would have written this letter uh, from Corinth during his third missionary um, journey. Now, towards uh, the end of this letter, you know, Paul shares that, uh, you know, he desires to uh, go to Jerusalem uh, to, you know, give the saints or the believers their offerings that he has uh, collected from various churches to help them in their difficulties, in their struggles. Um, and uh, he shares his intent to travel to Spain from Jerusalem. And uh, when he travels from Spain from Jerusalem, he uh, shares his desire to stop at Rome on his way to Spain. And that we read in Romans chapter 15, verses uh, 22 to 23. Okay. Uh, I'd like one of you to please read Romans chapter 15, verses 22 to 23, please. Anyone could read that? Romans chapter 15, verses 22 to 23. Can someone unmute your mics and read, please? Fifteen was twenty-two to twenty-three. Can you all hear um, her? Online students, can you hear her? No, ma'am. No, we couldn't hear you. Rosalind, would you like to um, read? Shall I read? Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you 
but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you whenever i journey to spain i shall come to you for i hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first i may enjoy your company for a while i'll continue ma'am yes please till verse 33 Okay. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things. their duty is also to minister to them in material things therefore when i have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit i shall go by i shall go by way of you to spain but i know that when i come to you i shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of christ now i beg you brethren through the lord jesus christ and through the love of the spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to god for me that i may be delivered from those in judea who do not believe and that my service for jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints that i may come to you with joy by the will of god and may be refreshed together with you now the god of peace be with you all amen Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. Good to hear your voice again. Okay, so here we see Paul's heart. Here in verse twenty-three, he says, "You know, having a great desire these many years to come to you." So we see Paul's just pouring out his heart. That his heart's desire is, you know, to meet the believers at Rome. You know, there's such a powerful church. There's, uh, you know, believers there. He's never met them before, and his heart's desire is just to, uh, you know, to go and meet them. And verse twenty-nine, he says, you know, he desires to come to them in the full blessings of uh, the gospel of Christ. So he says, but I know that when I come to you, verse twenty-nine, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of. Christ. So we see here, you know, Paul's heart that he wants to go to the believers, and he also wants to give them or bring to them something spiritually. He feels that he can give to them spiritually. He can, you know, impart to them uh, spiritually, and that is his motivation of um, going there. You know, some of us who are, um, you know, traveling evangelists. or some of us who like to go for mission trips or uh, uh, you know to go to different places and minister you know what is that that motivates us to go and minister in a city you know is it uh, just thinking that hey i've never been to the city before it's a good opportunity to go and uh, minister and also you know a good time to uh, you know see the city you know sightseeing uh, also recreational uh, maybe you have some old friends or family someone there relative that you've never had the opportunity and you think hey i can go for this mission trip or i can go to minister there and also it can be a sightseeing trip or a recreational thing um you know what is the, your motivation you see that you know paul's motivation is you know to go to rome i'm not saying that it's wrong Uh, to go and uh, you know minister uh, at the same time you know take a look at the place enjoy the beauty of the place and not saying it's wrong but what is our overarching motivation here we see that it's paul's desire or his motivation to give into their lives to impart to them uh, spiritually spiritually to give them something in the um, 
spirit. It is uh, his desire to impart to them the full blessings of the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. And he is wanting to strengthen them uh, spiritually. And uh, that is, you know, what should motivate us, or that is what should motivate people from going from place to place uh, to minister, that we want to impart spiritually into their, their lives, that we have something that we want to give into them, and we want to impart to them the full blessings of the gospel of Jesus uh, Christ. And also, we see that Paul shares what he is planning to uh, do. Uh, there was a famine in Jerusalem, so Paul is encouraging the believers in the churches that he had started in the region of Achaia, Corinth, and Macedonia uh, to contribute to the saints at Jerusalem. And he intends to take this offering to give it to the believers there. And then he wants to go on to Spain on, and on his way, he wants to stop at Rome and meet his uh, meet the people there at Rome. Okay. Now, who started the church at Rome? Any thoughts on that? Who started the church at Rome? Yes. Maybe Aquila and Priscilla, okay. Who started the church at Rome? Any thoughts? Even I go with Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, Rosalind says Aquila and Priscilla. Yes, Lubega. I'm just thinking, um, I've not read it anywhere, but I think there is also a possibility that after there was some there was some persecution in in Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen so there is a, I might think that one is might also be a, a hypothesis inside there and also there is the 120 people is this 300 people who were preached to during the Pentecostal day so I also think there is something there if I'm not mistaken and again, I would also go for the third one, but that's that would be my hypothesis. I haven't read it anywhere. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Rubega. Good to hear your voice after a long time. Uh, yes, your uh, you know your thoughts, your hypothesis is right. Um, uh, Subashi says Peter maybe. Okay, thank you, Subashi. Yes, uh, Enoch. Oh, good morning, ma. Uh, good morning, success. Actually, I'm Priscilla. I didn't know husband and wife. So uh, two of them started the ministry. Okay. Thank you. Good to hear you, Enoch. Success. Okay. Um, uh, actually, what Rubega said is uh, right. You know, um, what we know is that on the day of Pentecost, you know, many Jews from Rome, from Asia, from Europe, from all parts of the world would come to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Passover feast. Okay. And um, they would stay back in Jerusalem for some of them. They would stay back for a longer period of time, for a period of 60 days, uh, because the feast of the unleavened bread the feast of the Passover, you know, the celebration uh, of these these sixty days, you know, begin with the feast of the unleavened bread and the Passover, and these two festivals are closely connected and take place during the same time period. Uh, we know that the Passover commemorates uh, when the Israelites uh, were delivered from slavery um, in Egypt. And the feast of the unleavened bread involves the removal of the leaven, or it, uh, you know, it uh, signifies the removal of, or involves the removal of eats from their homes uh, for a week um, as a symbol of purity and leaving behind, um, you know, um, 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 basically, you know, leaving behind the sinful ways of just, you know, whole. Uh, significance of leaving behind uh, the sinful ways of Egypt. So these festivals occur uh, in the early spring, usually around March and April. And after the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the Passover was the Feast of the First Fruits, uh, which is celebrated. So it's basically a Thanksgiving uh, festival uh, uh, for the first fruits of the barley harvest. 
And during this festival, you know, um, the first sheaves of the barley uh, harvest is presented as an offering to the Lord, acknowledging his uh, provision and his blessing on the agricultural harvest. And it was a symbol of hope and a promise of bountiful harvest to come. Okay, And after this, after uh, 50 days, after the Feast of the First Fruits, came the Feast of the Weeks, also known as Pentecost. So the name Pentecost is uh, derived from the Greek, uh, Greek term Pentecostos, which means 50th. So this uh, festival basically marks the conclusion of the grain harvest and uh, is the beginning of the feast of the first fruits. And on this occasion, you know, offerings of food and animals is presented to the Lord, um, you know, uh, in a more lavish way, uh, basically expressing their gratitude for the abundance of harvest that he is going to uh, provide. Okay. So all of these festivals happen during the same time, the 60-day period. So there's many Jews come from all over the world, uh, specifically from Rome and, uh, you know, um, from Asia, Asia Minor and um, Europe uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, this. Okay. Now, um, while we don't have information of who really founded the church, at Rome, but we have some background information that uh, there were visitors from Rome, uh, both Jews and proselytes. Now, who are the proselytes? Uh, Gentiles who were converts to Judaism. We read this in Acts chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. So, can one of you please read Acts chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, please? Acts chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. This is on the day of Pentecost. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yes. yes. Acts chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. And how here, and how here we, every man in our own hope, wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Yeah. Phrygia and Pamphylia and in Egypt and in the parts of Libya, about Sidon and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We don't hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So here, here we, we see, here we see in Acts chapter two, verses eight to eleven. You know, um, this is just um, uh, you know mentioning about what happened, what just happened at the, the upper room when the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, all of these people are mentioned who come from different um, places and they hear the disciples or hear the 120 who were there in the upper room talking in the languages that they had from the places they had come from. It's talking about visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So I said uh, proselytes are Gentiles who embrace Judaism. Um, so they were all present at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And some of these visitors from Rome uh, would have become believers in Jesus Christ, just like Vega said. When they heard uh, uh, Peter preach the sermon, they were cut in their hearts, and 3,000 of them uh, accepted uh, Jesus as their uh, Lord and uh, Savior. And so we, uh, it's most likely that, you know, these um, people who had come from Rome, you know, who heard Peter preach and who uh, became part of the church now, became believers, they would have stayed back for some more time there, just, you know, uh, receiving teachings of the apostles, being established in the teachings of the apostles, and, um, you know, and when they go back 
to Rome. Uh, they came from, you know, they would have um, established uh, spirit-filled churches or also, like he said, you know, um, uh, the persecution of Stephen when the church would have been, uh, Rosalind said, I think, you know, uh, no, not Rosalind. Uh, Lubega said that. Anyways, uh, you know, they were persecuted and they spread out. They would have gone to Rome. Um, so we can infer that these people who were there during the time of Pentecost and stayed back and, you know, they received teachings of the apostles, they've established the teachings of the apostles, um, they would have gone back to Rome and would have started spiritual churches there, um, established churches there. And, uh, you know, that's how they would have spoken about Jesus. They would, exp they would have spoken about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, they would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, began churches there at um, Rome. Okay. Um, so we can say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church uh, because these believers who went back from Jerusalem, had received the teachings of the apostles, they would have been baptized in water, they would have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and, uh, you know, they were also established in the teachings of the apostles, and uh, they go back and they begin uh, the church, uh, the uh, churches at Rome, okay? Now, the believers at Rome were a mixed group, basically consisting of uh, both Jews and Gentile uh, believers. Now, when um, Claudius brings about issues this edict in AD 49 that all the Jews have to leave Rome, uh, you know, they would have left their churches like Aquila and Priscilla and moved on to various cities. Um, so the church at Rome would have just been comprising of Gentile believers. So during the next five years, till AD 54, uh, the church at Rome was led by leaders who were Gentile believers. And then subsequently, you know, Jewish believers would have returned back like Aquila and Priscilla. After AD 54, they were returned back to Rome. Um, and in some cases, you know, they would have to serve under the Gentile uh, believers. But the church at Rome uh, must have been made up of various uh, or several house churches because in those days, you know, Christians were persecuted. They were not given land. Uh, they, had, they, they did not have their own places where they could build uh, churches. And because of the fear of persecution, they would have met quietly in various uh, homes. So we see this happening at uh, Rome and also at Ephesus, there were several house churches. And, uh, you know, we also know that when Paul was writing, he also mentions about the church that meets in Aquila and Priscilla's house. We read this in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 to 5. So can somebody please read Romans chapter 16, verses 3 to 5, please? Anyone? Romans 16, 3 to 5. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruit of uh, Achaia to Christ. Thank you, Zelatoli. Good to hear your voice. Um, so Paul's, uh, you know, uh, his, uh, his uh, letter to the saints at Rome, you know, he says would, would have been read across all of these house churches uh, to build them up and encourage uh, them. So he's, um, you know, we know that there were several house churches that used to meet at various parts uh, at Rome and also various other uh, cities. Okay, now we'll just look at a few key highlights as part of our introduction to this uh, epistle to the church at Rome. A few key highlights about uh, Romans. Um, you know, Romans is, um, you know, a, 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 an episode where the gospel is mentioned in 
detail. It, uh, the book of Romans explains to us very clearly what the gospel is. It defines the gospel to us very clearly. Uh, it just mentions that we are sinners. Christ died for us. He rose up again. And whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness of sin. So this is, uh, you know, uh, one epistle which mentions uh, very clearly the gospel and very in a very detailed explanation, uh, uh, in a detailed way, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is explained uh, to us. The second highlight of the book of Romans is that our spiritual journey is described very clearly here. Uh, and uh, uh, it starts off with uh, the existence of God in Romans chapter 1. And then in chapter 1 and verses 2, it talks about sinful depravity of man, how man has moved away from the knowledge of God, from the truth of God, has uh, believed the lies and lived the lies, and how God has given them up to their own, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, choice that they have made and to the lies that they want to believe. We read this in Romans chapter 1 and 2. Then it talks about the consequence of sin very beautifully explained in Romans chapter 3 in uh, and Christ's atoning work on the cross which is mentioned uh, written to us in Romans chapter 3 uh, uh, chapters 3 and 4 and then how we can be justified and receive a righteousness through grace by faith uh, we read this in chapter 5 and how to overcome sin on the basis of the cross chapter 6 and 7 how to walk in righteousness by the Spirit, the beautiful chapter in Romans chapter 8, powerful, beautiful chapter, Romans 8, and how we can live the Christian life in Romans chapter 12 uh, to chapter 15. So hence, in this epistle of uh, Romans, Paul describes our spiritual journey. So if someone has to read the book of Romans, you know, they can get saved. Uh, they can learn how to overcome sin. Uh, they can also learn uh, the Christian life. And so Paul takes us through a good journey, uh, uh, you know, of all of these things. And it's a good journey that Paul can take someone through their entire uh, life from, you know, from sin, how they can get saved, how can they overcome sin, and how to live the Christian uh, life. Another key highlight is that the book of Romans talks to us about the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is being revealed. We know that God is righteous. He's just. Uh, he cannot be blamed uh, for anything that he does because he's totally, completely, always righteous. When we say righteous, what do we mean by the word righteous? What is the meaning of righteous? When we say God is righteous, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say God is righteous? He's just holy. He's right. Basically means that he is right all the time in the justice that he brings about, in the judgment that he brings about, in his promises, in his word, in his dealings with us, in every way uh, we see that he is um, right. So the, the major theme through the book of Romans is righteousness. The word righteousness is used 36 times throughout this book. And we see that God being righteous in judging sin, Romans chapter 1 and 2, we see God being righteous in forgiving sins on the basis of Christ's atoning work. Romans chapter 3 and 5, God imparting his righteousness to the believers in Romans chapter 5. The believers walking in righteousness by the Spirit in verses six, uh, chapter 6 and 8. And the believer living a righteous life in chapters 12 to 15. So we don't find this treatment of righteousness in any other book in the Bible as we find it here in the book of Romans. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll continue more about the key highlights in the book of Romans in our next class on Friday. So I'll meet you all on Friday. Uh, I'd like you all to just uh, read the book of Romans and looking forward to meeting you all on Friday. Thank you all. Have a good day and a good week ahead. God bless.